Jerry, what is the one thing that brings the world together? The nectar of the gods. Mmm, coffee. What is happening, you beautiful bastards? Welcome back, you beautiful bastards, to another week. This week we have a great guest for you guys. It's Cole the Science Dude. He's TikTok famous now. He is, and we're ta- going to be talking about all things sciency. Uh, other than that, Jerry has has some crap to talk about. I I don't know. What are, just do do whatever the fuck you're doing. Well, you know you know what it is. A uh, little bit of news. You know, some things happened since the last episode. So you know, let's find out what happened between then and now. So, in the news, I'm not going to keep it strictly American this week. Because there's some exciting happenings coming out of China. Mm. It looks like they may have uh, somehow gotten their hands on the original Mars rover and changed the labels. <laughs> they put new stickers on it's it? It's kind of the Chinese way, I guess. They're really good at making stuff as long as someone else made it first. I'm sorry, that might not be true. China has a new Mars rover. It's called the, uh, the Zurong. You think, does that sound right, Chris? Uh, probably not. They sent it up. It landed successfully. And uh, I'd imagine... Grizz, they're probably going to start battle bots on Mars pretty soon. Dude, I'm just, that's what I'm ready for. Listen, if NASA, what if, I don't know what China's space program is, but uh, if NASA China and the space. Chinese, <laughs> China space, <laughs> if they, space China, <laughs> uh, if the two of them start duking it out like fucking battle bots, I'll be watching. See, that's where NASA fucked up. They just look at the helicopter go up. Ooh, it went 10 feet. No, they need to fucking start robot carnage on mars even better everyone who comes afterwards will be like what the fuck happened here <laughs> <laughs> some civilization is going to find that in a million years uh so that's what's going on with china uh in other news some big happenings in alabama some serious changes oh there's always big happenings in alabama it's just usually sister on brother crime <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh some good news for a change coming out of alabama for those of you who don't know for the last 30 years in Alabama, yoga has been banned in public schools. Well, do you know what their reasoning was? I do. And it's it stems from Christianity because, as some of you may know, that area is part of the Bible Belt. They're very religious down there in terms of Christianity. And 30 years ago, Christians of the day said, I don't want yoga in the school because it might lead people to switch over to Hinduism. I don't want that yoga shit. It was <laughs> Satan. Uh, now we've got some sense about us. This is 2021. We realize doing yoga is not necessarily going to change your belief in your religion. It's just going to give you, you know, it's going to make you more limber, a little bit more relaxed. Yeah, but that's the Satan's work. Holy shit. 86% of fucking Alabama is Christian. Yeah. It's big business. <laughs> oh, fuck me. 1% is non-Christian faith. They're probably the Hindus. 12% is unaffiliated with any religion. So you got Christians, you got atheists, and... One percent. Hindus? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say Hindus <laughs> since that's who the Alabama Christians are afraid of. I think they're just afraid of anyone non-Christian. We just alienated <laughs> part of our fucking listeners. Well done, Jerry. Now, listen, I like Hindus just as much as Christians. I'm not religiously affiliated, so I don't care. I'm, I'm unaffiliated. That's how far I would go. In other news, though, let's talk about houses. Chris, what do you know about houses? They're square. Sometimes. Sometimes they're a rectangle. <laughs> but, uh, here in America, not only are they square or rectangles, but they're outrageously unaffordable right now. They're expensive as fuck. I don't think it's a bubble. I'm not an analyst, but basically there's a shortage. It's not really like fake inflated prices. There's just a lot of people who want houses and not a lot of houses. Well, is it not a lot of houses or is just no one can afford the fucking houses? It's both, actually. There's So there's, you know, about the lumber shortage. But if you oh, yeah. let's take a look at uh, the... The reserves, how many houses are for sale at one time. They expect oh, a healthy, balanced market to have about a six-month supply for sale at any given time. Okay. Right now, we have about a two-month supply, which is a difference of about like a, somewhere between one and three million houses. I don't know the exact number for the difference. Everyone, I think everyone who wanted to move did that in 2020. <laughs> mm, I promise and you that's not over. Want, but you know what I mean? The people who want to buy... Yeah. They're still there, but everyone else who was like, fuck this house, I'm stuck in this bitch, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. Uh, but it's just really getting worse because just like the financial housing crisis that we had uh, around 2008, back then the government saw a lot of issues coming up with all these houses being foreclosed and they said, hey, companies, 
can you buy all these houses so that we're not totally fucked and just rent them to people? And they did. <laughs> it didn't work out well. And we're now in a different situation where the government is also pushing them to buy these houses again, but for a totally different reason that's not entirely clear to me. But I can tell you that about one to five houses are purchased in cash by a buyer who never actually lives there. Well, yeah. I mean, for people outside the U.S. or in different parts of the country, that might not make sense. But up here, like, I see houses get torn down all the time. Yeah, (laughs) it's... Well, no, I don't mean that they're tearing them down. I mean, corporations are buying them and renting them out, but it's, it's beyond just renting them out. They're not... They're not responsible landlords. They're essentially the new slumlord. I'm seeing more and more the the like high rise fucking um, condos, apartment complexes yeah, yeah. going up. And those are cool too because they serve a really good purpose for people who are okay with living in them. Now we're going to be in a situation where you know you have a starter home that would normally be under two hundred thousand dollars going for three hundred fifty, and a, you know a young family can't compete with a company. Oh, nowadays it's getting ridiculous what it costs. I mean, it's up by us. Down down south, it's not too bad. I want to say depends on where uh, you live, but it's it's going up generally everywhere. Well, the problem is, you know, it still has to do with what you make, right? But it's still it's not getting better. Nope. Even with everyone moving out of California in droves like they are, their prices aren't even coming down. Yeah, that one blows my mind. Like who the who the fuck could afford to live out there? My beloved Texas is exploding with people, and uh, I probably won't be able to afford to move there. On top of that, I guess, according to Grizz, they're just going insane with Republican ideology. I don't know. Uh, I told you, like, a few weeks ago, you were screwed. They were they were going to turn... Well, so they're fighting the, the, the Californians hard that moved in, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, can you can you win against Californians? <laughs> I, that, it's like a cancer. It's just going to take over. They're a virus. <laughs> oh my god, no! <laughs> Correction, oh my Keanu, no! <laughs> Mr. Anderson, the Californians are a virus. <laughs> I would agree with fucking with, with Agent Smith, all right? <laughs> so anyway, that's about all the news I have for you guys today. Grizz, what do you think? What's up next? Ah, uh, Jess. Uh, so, you will learn in this episode that Cole has an excellent coffee recipe it's towards the end of the episode so you'll have to stick around to actually learn it and i figured before we air this episode i should try it and actually inform you if it's worth a damn uh it's a little pricey to get started i'm not gonna recommend his 200 dollar uh thingamabob i went with the cheaper 40 dollar option <laughs> Uh, but the coffee came out great, dude. Uh, both my wife, Joan, and myself. Uh, I'm not a black coffee drinker. Mm-hmm. Normally, I drink with a little bit of cream, or actually, I use coffee mate most of the time. Uh, but you could drink this straight, and it's delicious. I have not made it yet, but I intend to. Maybe I'll just take a trip up to Grizz's house and have some of his. That's true. Uh, I will warn people, the initial uh, burst out of the nitrogen whipper is a little powerful. <laughs> I guarantee anyone who tries this will blast coffee around their house. <laughs> so stick around, find out how it works and how to make it because it's the best damn cup of coffee you will ever have. And with that, let's talk to Cole. Uh, all right, Jerry, my, my ears are bleeding. Enough of this this crap. What are we doing today? <laughs> well, today we have uh, Cole the science dude here to talk to us about science. Hey, Cole, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? Good, good. Thanks for coming on the show. No problem. I'm always happy to proselytize the good word of science. Oh, man. He's already smarter than us, Chris. He's using <laughs> words. <laughs> that doesn't like a walking th- thesaurus. <laughs> so uh, you're kind of, uh, you're starting to really come up on the internet. Yeah, and apparently. What was it? Your uh, TikTok is where you're big? Yes. Uh, so I originally started making videos a little over a year ago, uh, back in March of 2020, right at the, kind of the beginning of the, the pandemic lockdown. And uh, it all started with just me making some videos literally in my garage. Uh, and apparently people thought they were pretty interesting. So they they blew up a bit more than I was expecting. And just by continuing to post content since then and, and invest more effort and time into it, it's kind of grown into its own little thing. And uh, recently I have surpassed about half a million uh, followers now on TikTok. I think today I'm at 535,000. So yeah, it's, it's grown into quite a little fun experience. Oh, congratulations on the success. Um, Thank you. 
has it become like your day job now? Is this your full time? No, thing? no. So I, I do still have a day job and I, I don't think, well, I mean, never say never. I, you know, originally I never thought there was even the potential for it to be kind of a day job. And now I could certainly see that possibility. Uh, but at least for now, I do still have my day job and I have uh, a, a, an employment opportunity that it will be coming up in May of next year that I'm in the mm -hmm. process of transitioning to. And I'm I'm so excited about that that I don't think or at least for now, I don't see TikTok taking over as the daytime because uh, luckily I'm finally making the uh, the transition from citizen scientist to scientist by profession. Uh, so I will be moving into the research sciences. Cool. Oh, that's pretty exciting. Anything specific you're going to be researching? Yeah, uh, I'm going to be researching uh, specifically the genetics of cannabis and different bioavailable effects of cannabis and how they may combine with other potentially medicinal herbs and the chemistry of all that. It's a subject I'm super interested in, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to wor work with the people that I work with uh, or I'm going to be working with because they're a real cool group of folks. It's also an industry that's about to, I mean, it's already taken off, but it's about to really take off. True, especially true. Especially with all the research. Yeah. And I think the federal legalization, which is uh, eminent, given the fact that more of the country, I think it's a, uh, the last study I saw said almost 90 percent of people uh, support the legalization of it, the very least medicinal cannabis, uh, which if you had asked me, could you get 90 percent of Americans to agree that the, as the sky is blue? I probably would have said no. Uh, so a number like that, I think federal legalization is definitely incoming and will obviously boom the industry like crazy so it's fun to be on the kind of forefront of that oh absolutely and I, the other like you're starting to see states getting on it because they're realizing how much money they can make off of it exactly yeah and it's a big boost for the economy too oh, hell yeah. it is now that now Colorado that we've uh, gave back money what two years ago oh yeah yeah when yeah. they when they were first starting to boom with when it yeah the they hell did. has that ever happened in the history of taxes <laughs> <laughs> Well, now that everybody's recognizing the failure that is the war on drugs, we're kind of doing an about yes, face with everything. Exactly. Which I think is a really good thing because our country's kind of held on to the for, you know, to use an appropriate metaphor, the pipe dream of winning the war on drugs. And uh, I think overall it's done nothing but, uh, you know, skyrocket our crime rates, cause a lot of American deaths and, and ruin big portions of the economy. And you know, oh, ultimately, yeah. I think that, like you mentioned, doing this about face and turning towards a more um, drug, I don't want to say drug positive culture, but I personally have a bit of a, a radical opinion that I don't think any uh, substance with regards to like, you know, drugs should be uh, illegal because I don't think that there's really a benefit to making it illegal. I think that we need to stop looking at drug addiction as being a crime and we need to treat it more as a medical phenomenon, which is what it seems to be. Mm. Um and I think that when you look at countries like Portugal that underwent a kind of radical deregulation of their drug industry and a full legalization of narcotics, and then saw this massive reduction of opioid usage, of stimulant usage, of benzodiazepine usage, um, and it, it you know, had an overall positive effect in terms of getting people that were struggling with these things off, I think for a country that is as locked into the opioid pandemic as, or the opioid crisis as we are, uh, that would be a very beneficial thing. Absolutely. And actually, uh Grizz and I have dug into the war on drugs a little bit, and uh, we actually plan to do an entire episode on that in the future. Oh, sweet. Really, at the end of the day, the war, the war on drugs was never about stopping drug use. It no. Was, it was a whole other issue. We could talk for hours on that. It was but, racism. Yeah, it, it was racism. Racism and hip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we actually, one of the main topics that we were interested in that you've been looking into lately is... Uh, Grizz and I have our own personal addiction to uh, the nectar of the gods. Oh, Why? yes. Yes. <laughs> Caffeine, the world's greatest drug. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's another thing that 90% of America is actually addicted to. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. I actually swore that I would never drink it right up until I, I think I was 28 or 29. I had to work wow. third shift and uh, I put it, putting myself on third shift. I needed coffee. Yeah. That's and crazy I, that you were able to resist it for that long. Well, you know what it was? I didn't like the flavor until then. And it's I definitely guess, an acquired taste. It is. So in my early 20s, I tried it. I'm like, oh, God, that's disgusting. Why are you drinking that? And then I needed it because I needed caffeine. I'm like, yeah. you know what? 
this is delicious. It's also interesting when, when you, you know, like we were just talking about the drug war, how we draw this kind of arbitrary line that like, you know, caffeine, perfectly acceptable. Everyone does it, even though it is chemically addictive. It is, yeah. you know, it is a, for all intents and purposes, it is a drug. It's just a drug that we decided eh, it's, we're fine. Let's keep it. But then we draw these arbitrary definitions on, on other things. It kind of makes you wonder, uh, had there not been the social tabooity around it, what other sort of things would be uh, as prominent as coffee use is now? Uh, we'd still have Coke in our cola. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and morphine in our cough syrup. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It came down to who was using coffee and who was using heroin. Of course, and yeah. The politicians weren't using heroin. Well, some of them weren't. And <laughs> they needed votes. Yep. Well, you know, I can't remember the guy's name, but there's a professor. Uh, I can't quite remember. Uh, but he advocates drug use and he advocates the same thing. Well, I don't want to say it's the same thing as you, Cole, because you didn't advocate drug use. You just advocated not not making everything illegal. Yeah, I think that there are certain certain uh, pharmacological compounds that can right. have benefits in, in specific scenarios. I'm not going to do a blanket term like everyone should go out and do coke. But I definitely yeah. think that there are <laughs> a, there are a lot more medicinal benefits to a lot more narcotics than most people are willing to give credit to. Um and I hope yeah, especially that, that psychedelics. It, exactly. And, and that's one of the things that I'm really excited about, too, is, you know, of course, we're about to hit this kind of boom of the cannabis industry once we hit federal uh, legalization. But I also think it's really interesting that we're kind of seeing this. Uh, people have been referring to it, to it as a psychedelic renaissance, you know, much like in the 60s, but finally in a more mainstream light. Uh, and I think it's really powerful because now, and even though some of this data was around in the 60s, it was nowhere near as well clinically studied. But now we have a lot of lab evidence to, sh to support the fact that, you know, dissociative hallucinogens like uh, mushrooms and LSD and ketamine can have extraordinarily profound effects in fighting uh, treatment resistant anxiety and depression in helping people come, you know, face death in the wake of a terminal illness diagnosis. And I think that there's you know, a lot of benefit and a lot of moral worth to investigating the use of these substances uh, in these specific scenarios. So I'm, I'm happy to see that our culture is beginning to embrace them more. I live in California where uh, in Oakland, I believe they either already have or they are considering the full decriminalization of mushrooms. Uh, that's the one that I think all of us are on the next page for. But I, I just read an article today that uh, they were doing a study of microdosing LSD for PTSD t patients. Yeah, where, where after they did a microdose, they could not clinically uh, diagnose them with PTSD anymore because they weren't showing any symptoms. Yeah, That's it's ridiculous. tremendous. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. And the other thing that I, I think is never really talked about with regards to kind of the harm that this arbitrary scheduling of drugs uh, that we have in the United States does because, you know, we have this whole schedule one, schedule two, schedule three thing. Uh, and anyone who's looked into this knows that, uh, the, the definition for what makes a substance schedule one, which is like the most illegal that a, a narcotic can get, um, is that, well, yeah, they're a joke, but the definition is that there's no accepted medical benefit to it. There are very few narcotics that don't have at least some potentially medicinal use for them. But more importantly, uh, when you look at things that are on that list, there are things like, of course, cannabis is Schedule One federally right now, but even though it has numerous medical benefits, but there are also much more obscure chemicals on that list that people don't really know about that are forefronts for what could potentially be genuinely revolutionary medicine. Um, there's currently a, a substance that's Schedule One in America called Ibogaine. Uh, and the reason that I can speak to this, by the way, is that one of my many, many hobbies is the study of neuropharmacology. And that's the, the study of how different pharmacological substances interact with the brain and can cause, you know, biological effects. And there's this chemical called Ibogaine uh, that I did a bunch of work on the back of the blackboard behind me. And uh, it's, its primary use, when most people hear about it, is that it, it's really effective uh, how good would this be for America at helping people get off narcotics? It is itself uh, a semi-opioid. So it'll, it'll interact with the same uh, system in the brain that some opioids do. And it's very effective at getting somebody who's like a long-term heroin addict to come off cleanly without dying from detox symptoms or, you know, or relapsing. Um, but it's got all these tiny little uh, secondary effects that, that don't get investigated because it's schedule one, one of the ones, which I think is the most impressive um, 
there's evidence clinically that people uh, who take uh, ibogaine in small doses for uh, you know a period of time, so not like one trip, but you know maybe for multiple weeks, it promotes the release of something called a GDNF protein uh, in your brain, and this is one of the only substances known in science to actually help uh, in the regrowth of dead or damaged dopaminergic neurons that have been uh, damaged as a result of somebody who has Parkinson's disease. So. Parkinson's is generally regarded as just being, you know, it's neurodegenerative, meaning it gets worse over time. And the best you can kind of do is slow or, you know, maybe at best stop the symptoms. Whereas Ibogaine it potentially could be an avenue for helping people, you know, get some muscle use back, get some fine coordination back and actually improve the degeneration over time. Um, but despite the fact that America is home to some of the best scientific research institutes in the world, uh, we, we can't study it because it's schedule one here and the, the regulations in place to prevent scientists from working with this are so obstructive and expensive that it's not worth it for the small subset of people that have Parkinson's and it gets boiled down to this kind of cost benefit analysis. Yep. It's yeah. a lot of times we just find out that with all the research that we do on our end of, of several different things, America just is always constantly stepping on its own toes. Yeah. And like, cause even if, so say it, it does become legal and they can use it. Now you run into the problem of actually, uh, it has to go through this 10 year long process to become a medicine. And even then a lot of times they won't put forth the money, they being pharmaceutical companies, right. put forth the money that it takes for 10 years. Like it's some ridiculous number, like 85% of all the drugs out there that are new are really just rescripts of what they've already done because they don't want to go through that miserable process. Yeah. Of making sure it's healthy for everyone. Yeah. Which again, I understand why it's there, but it stops us from having new things. True. It's a really unfortunate. <sighs> yeah. It dramatically guess... impedes progress. And actually the, the scheduling chart or whatever you want to uh, phrase it, it's uh, really self-defeating because it's, as you said, Cole, you can't, you can't have, uh, any of these drugs off the list because they're quote unquote, there's no medicinal properties. But as long as the government says there aren't any, they'll never check them to see if they are in which case exactly in other countries, they've been tested and they have medicinal purposes. Yeah. And there are Ibogaine clinics that aid people in, in coming off of opioids in Canada and Mexico, mm -hmm. both of our neighboring countries that right. are so effective that people in America who have the opportunity or the ability to afford to go do that, when they need to detox, they'll go to one of these Ibogaine clinics and it's incredibly effective uh, at getting somebody off. And, and the success rate is a lot higher than traditional rehabilitation, like what we see in the States, because there's some level of chemical interaction happening. You know, isn't it also that, like a lot of the things that were on there were originally created for medical use. So they had to have some sort of, you know what I mean? Like they had to have some medical use at some point. I know cocaine did. I'm, we all know at this point that cannabis does yeah like fentanyl come on i mean i don't know if that's actually on the schedule it's got to be because that one yeah it is that it's all medical you it started as medical use well what's really interesting is that the guy who uh was able to introduce like the first fentanyl samples into the united states opioid supply uh, did I saw an interview with a friend of his who spoke about how his original intention for releasing it was good because, over, you know, originally it could be manufactured for much cheaper and it could be diluted because fentanyl is incredibly potent, unfortunately. And so his thought was that by releasing it, it would give the, the American drug market an ability to produce its own opioid rather than having to import from countries that have larger supplies of poppy fields um, and then bring it over and support kind of the international drug trade. Uh, and he just didn't, you know, his intentions for releasing it originally were to try and help people. Uh, but, and because it was so much more chemically pure and, and you were able to produce it yourself, there was less of a chance of it getting stepped on. But unfortunately now it's being laced into products that aren't sold with fentanyl and it's making people overdose. It's way more chemically addictive, which he, he claims not to have known. And it's kind of that butterfly effect of trying to do a good thing, but the consequences ended up being quite the opposite. Yeah. I mean, you're getting into a whole another line of, of uh, we could have a whole episode on the opioid epidemic. Yeah, invite me back for the uh, drug war one. <laughs> I mean, dude, we'll do it. Because, uh, 
my wife works in the ER and the stories that come out of there, everyone who comes in, who's, who's got an overdose or who's going through an overdose, they're trying to seek the overdose because the mm -hmm. highest is the best right before you go down. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's a really fucked up mentality. And we're just narcanning them and pushing them out the door. And yep. then they come back the next day. Um, we're trying to get an interview set up with the, one of our doctors just to be able to talk to them about like how much fatigue they have with this, with this issue. Yeah. I mean, on both sides, it's gotten to the point now where, you know, I as just like a normal person with no experience or uh, in terms of addiction to ongoing or otherwise opioids, I have a, a naloxone or a, 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 a the the stuff that you scored up the nose, the name is escaping me. You just said Narcan. Like, thank you. I have a Narcan um, spray kit in my car uh, just because I figured the odds in living in America that I come across somebody having an overdose are higher than a lot of other things. Oh, yeah. And if I could be able to potentially save somebody's life, it's cheap enough. It's reversible. It's it just made sense to me to have one. But I think it's sad that we're at that point yeah. where, you know, I, despite not being an opioid addict, thought this could save someone's life. I'll keep this, you know, on me. Like, it's just, I mean, it's unfortunate. Good on you, man. But the other thing is with fentanyl, the scary truth is it, for a person like yourself or myself or Jerry, uh, who's never come in contact with it, literally just touch, touching it will drop you. you know True. I mean? If you haven't been on any other drugs, yeah, just touching fentanyl will make you overdose. And mm -hmm. uh, all right, one Narcan will get you, but an over, like uh, if you take someone who's been using fentanyl and has a high tolerance to it you have to hit them a couple of different times like i've heard up to 12. wow i didn't wow. know that like it, it all comes down to how much they've used you know what i mean yeah and it just to me like i said that's a whole nother episode <laughs> so we'll have to do that one afterwards <laughs> <laughs> now why uh why is something like caffeine which has a lot of the same properties as all these scheduled drugs why is that one something that i can just go get at dunkin donuts well, I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, the, the political motivation for the scheduling of, of a lot of these things had very little to do with the science or the actual medicinal benefit of any of this. Yeah. Uh, it really just came down to, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you guys found this in your research on the drug war, what sort of people can we target w by making this thing illegal? So, for example, back in the 60s, um, the, in the late 50s or early 60s, the cannabis uh, came up for a rescheduling. There was a vote on it that would potentially recategorize it out of the scheduling system and it would no longer be a Schedule One substance because it was prior to that as well. And uh, the, I believe it was the Nixon administration made the call that it wasn't worth descheduling because if they kept it a Schedule One substance, they could both break up anti-Vietnam War rallies and uh, pro-Mexican American rallies under the guise of a drug bust, as well as the right. the Black Panther Party, uh, which you know started in, in my home state in Oakland, which is you know only an hour's drive away. Um, and it really came down to the, the political motivation of using these sorts of things as a means of control. Yeah, that's that's actually most of the decisions made by all of our leadership for the last probably 50 years. Uh, one thing that keeps coming up that especially now on the news and in any political atmosphere, you got these, you know, you got both sides, Democrats and Republicans that are arguing over which side is right up in Congress. Mm -hmm. But they're they are for some reason under the impression that all of their leaders are making decisions in the best interests of their constituents. But at the end yeah. of the day, their, their decisions are based on their own interests. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would say at this point, anybody who still genuinely believes not that all politicians, but that the majority of politicians right. vote with the interest of their constituents in mind is either not paying attention or has chosen to be willingfully ignorant of <laughs> the, the reality of the situation. <laughs> yeah. That's, that looks like the most common probability here is there's a lot of ignorance, but you know, mm -hmm. that, that comes with social media. I think uh, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of saying social media is uh, the root of a lot of our common, uh, a lot of our uh, new problems here in the country. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of, uh, negative reinforcement mechanisms that have driven a number of, you know, societal effects. It's particularly, um, and I, there's a documentary called the social dilemma that goes into this a little bit on Netflix. Yeah, it's really good with that one. Yeah. Yeah. It, it all really just comes down to the fact that because of the way that these social media platforms incentivize 
uh, interaction with content, the methods that they use to, to keep you on the platform are particularly conducive to kind of uh, codifying an atmosphere of rage mm. and, and getting people riled up because r- people who are angry are, are active on a platform, right? It, yeah. If I see something that I agree with, I might like it. But if I see something that I disagree with, that's when I'm going to go into the comments and be like, well, actually, if you look at this study and it keeps me on the platform more okay. and that's all they want. They want the ad revenue. They want the, the clicks. They want the interaction. They want me to yes, pay that, for their business. It's that negative spiral that keeps people engaged. It's a, it's a wild thing because at the same time, social media, you can really say has a lot to do with why we're having this conversation about descheduling a lot of these drugs. Yeah. And that's why I think it's, it's really important to look at social media, not as just this net evil, but rather as a really powerful force. And like all really powerful forces, it can be good and it can be bad. Uh, I think a good analogy would be like uh, nuclear, right? Nuclear physics. You can use nuclear physics to build hydrogen bombs, which is pretty bad and very destructive, but you can also use it to use to power nuclear reactors and get clean energy or even better yet nuclear fusion. Right. Mm -hmm it's a tool like anything else and and you can use it for good and for bad. Uh, I think that what's really interesting about social media and, and the interconnectedness is that human societies have never been connected on such a macro level before where right. I, you know, am talking to you guys in real time. I don't even know where you live. I've had conversations on discord where at the same time I was speaking to people in Hamburg, Germany, and in uh, Bangladesh and in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, all at the same time. And that sort of human connectedness has never really existed before. Um, it's in such a, a prominent form. And so on one hand, it has the potential to be very beneficial in terms of fighting the tide of fascism and and misinformation from governments in places like China, but also it's not without its drawbacks, like any powerful force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're going to hear about all the negativity. You're not, you're not going to hear about anything that's positive. Yeah. I, uh, I always harp on the negatives of social media, but I usually almost always end that conversation with, I have really high hopes for it because it is a really powerful tool. And like you said, that's why we're talking to you. You're on the West Coast. We're on the East Coast right now. Okay. Yes, exactly. And we yeah. met through through a social media platform. I mean, you probably became familiar with my content through a social media platform. Exactly. And, that's exactly right. And that's why I, I, it's been a really interesting experience to be a, like a, a relatively large content creator, especially over the course of the last year as uh, the shit has hit the fan in biblical proportions. Um <laughs> Because it's really allowed me, like I, I, prior to being, you know, on, on TikTok and being a content creator, I was, and still am very critical of many aspects of social media, but it's also been really nice and very, uh, I don't know what the right word is. It's been cathartic, I guess, to kind of get to experience the, the good side, because when you look at my content, it spans a really wide range of things. Um, Mm -hmm. Like today, we'll, we'll be talking about global warming, and I've talked a lot about that. I, I have videos about the science behind coffee and many different other things. But if you break it down, like percentage of content, the majority of my content uh, focuses on like public health, viral epidemiology, and immunology, because we're going through the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So debunking myths about vaccines or 5G causing COVID, uh, explaining how the virus works, talking about the science behind why masks are effective, debunking conspiracy theories about uh, you know, a, a variety of things related to the the pandemic. Uh, and it, it's been really beneficial for me because I feel like I have kind of an amplified voice in that fight now. And whereas before I would just see people saying all this crazy shit and I couldn't really do anything other than hang my head and go, God, I can't believe it's come to this. <laughs> you know, now I can kind of fight the good fight with a relatively large audience and and help people. And one of the things that I am, you know, not to, I don't want to, toot my own horn too much here, but one, uh, I would say the thing that I am by far the most proud of in my career on TikTok over the last year has been that I have a a discord called the science dudes, where if people want to talk to me more than, you know, the TikTok comments will allow, um, they can jump in there and I'm very active. I talk to anyone who wants to talk to me uh, and I've, you know, cultivated a really cool community there. And we have a specific thread on that discord called vaccine talk, which is dedicated to uh, getting people from my TikTok videos who are either concerned about or skeptical or in straight denial about the vaccine, the pandemic, what have you. 
getting them in there and then just having like an open, honest conversation with them where I just directly in an, in as non-confrontational a way as possible, I just address their concerns and I can show them all the data that I've gone through and I can walk them through the science behind it. And uh, to date, I have inspired 12 people who were previously of either the skeptical or anti-vax uh, position that I know of um, to go be comfortable enough to actually go get vaccinated. And now all of them are fully vaccinated. And that made me feel like for all of the depression and anxiety that I picked up reading through the horrific wave of anti-vax comments on some of those videos, those 12 people made it all worth it because I, I feel like I made a tangible difference there. Which, I mean, well, when we're talking awesome. about vaccines, 12 people is actually a really big difference. Yeah. I mean, I would consider one, even if it were just, it's not the, the number of people, it's the fact that at all, I was able to take a person and, yeah. and help them, you know, do, do something safe that protects not only them, but other people. And that made me feel like the first time it happened, the first, because I, and I remember the moment very vividly, it was about six months ago uh, when I first started making really focused content about vaccines. Uh, I was talking to this person and they were saying, you know, when it comes out, I'm really skeptical about it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then when it actually came out, I got a message from them months after talking and they said, hey, I just wanted to let you know, you know, you made me feel a lot more comfortable with the idea of getting vaccinated. And today I got dose one of Pfizer. And that moment I was like, all this TikTok shit, all of the stress that's come from that, it was worth it because that one person, you know, I, I managed to help them get out of a bad situation. And everything since then, like when I get overwhelmed, I just focus on those people. And I know there's probably more I haven't heard from, but it, it makes me feel like uh, I'm I'm more positive about our chances of winning the fight, if that makes sense. I also think that it comes down to a certain amount when it when you're talking about social media and with the vaccine, you're going to have a specific group of people who are going to who are going to come to you. Right. Because they're looking for more science in their life. They're looking to understand things. They want to learn things, right? Which we're trying mm -hmm. to do on our show as well. And so when you have someone who's of that mind frame, who's debating the vaccine, and I can fully understand where they're coming from because of all the bullshit that's happened, you can work with them, right? You can logically talk with them and explain yeah. what's what the pros, cons, and everything else are. So, I mean, it's awesome that you got 12 people to move over. And on the same token, I can understand the people who don't, but they just got to look at all the data. Exactly. Yeah. The misinformation and the, the missing data is one of the reasons that we started the podcast because Andy and I both had no social media before the uh, podcast started up. Really? Wow. Yeah. And uh, so we've actually been learning how to use that as we go, but yeah. we, we have actually found now that we're on it. It's, it's a conscious effort to, to seek out the accurate, the accurate information and avoid these, uh, uh, these echo chambers of negativity. But yeah. again, like yourself, the, the purpose behind the podcast is to, we, what we do is we research things and put out information that is factually as accurate as we can get it. And we've actually exactly. done a vaccine episode as well, promoting them. And I actually just got my first shot of the Moderna. Uh, Congratulations. The 24th. So that's awesome. You. So I'm, I'm hoping that I don't have a, a rough time of the second shot, but I guess we'll see what happens. Yep. Yeah, I got that rough time will be a hell of a lot better than getting COVID itself. I got yeah, I, second, yeah. Uh, three I know hours. I won't be dead. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm double dosed up, ready to throw hands with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this actually, this same, the same thing applies to uh, climate change. Every time I look on social media, you know, it doesn't matter what the topic is on climate change. If you go through the comments, there's a crazy number of people that are saying that everything is just made up or, they have some yeah. nonsense to refute it. And what I don't understand is if they were to sit back and logically think about how they're trying to refute it and saying global warming is not real, their argument never makes sense. It's not based no, on it reality. Doesn't. Look at both those topics we just talked about. What, what's, the, what's the thing with them? Both of them were politicized. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that that's something that I've really hated over the, the course that kind of I don't want to say that humanity has taken, but specifically the course that America, which being a global superpower is really dangerous that we've taken, is this we're politicizing things where the science is just objectively settled on this. And what I don't like about that is that it promotes the idea that there is some discourse in the scientific community about the effectiveness of, of vaccines or about whether or not vaccines cause autism or about whether or not climate change is real or caused by humans. 
There is not. And that's why. So on uh, the 22nd on Earth Day of April, right, I did a roughly three and a half hour live stream where I went through all of the science on climate change, everything from like the Nash, the natural uh, glacial interglacial uh, temperature cycles that we get where we have like an ice age and then it warms up and explain how all that worked. And then, you know, I, I went through to what, what, how we know global warming is happening, how we know it back over time, how we know that humans are causing it, what we can do to fix it, everything. But I put a specific emphasis on backing up like the key claims, like things like CO2 is a greenhouse gas and greenhouse gases heat things up. And when I did that, I would pause and I would explain to the audience uh, how you can do experiments at home with virtually no supplies. I'm talking like 20 or $30 worth of stuff off, off Amazon. And you can confirm everything that I'm saying at home. And I feel like people don't really understand how easy it is to experimentally confirm that climate change is real without even leaving your house. Uh, and, and so I really tried to focus on that to be like, okay, if you don't believe me, then don't take my word for it. Just do, do this thing. And, and I'll show you. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's the fundamentals that people are missing. So they, they don't have the foundation for the knowledge to understand the climate change. And then they're being fed the wrong information afterwards. Exactly. So it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. To me. Yeah. What are we at for population right now in the world? What are we at? Nine? The world is it's We're just about eight billion now. We're just yeah, short of it. coming up on it. So eight billion. I'm sorry, but if you have eight billion of anything, one type, it's gonna change its environment. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. <laughs> there's no way it can't. Especially when you look at taking effect cars or anything else, just yeah. us. We're gonna change the world. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you look at humans' ability to modify our environment. I mean, as far as we know, we're the first species of anything on this planet that has developed the ability to invent adaptations faster than evolution can guide us towards them. Oh, it's cold? I'm not going to evolve thicker skin or more hair. I'm going to make a coat, right? That That's something that no other, other animals have been observed in very small ways using tools for very specific tasks and very, you know, oriented ways, but mm -hmm. it's the human ability to just generally invent and adapt and overcome that makes us the dominant force that we are. Uh, and, and to think that that does not extend, like you said, to the level of changing the environment that we live in would be a pretty crazy thing to think in the first place. Yeah. And again, you're fighting politics and politics is to me is a cult, right? It, it has yep. cult like followings people. They're not even going to use logic when it comes to it. It's just, this is my side. I'm holding my side no matter what. And I'm not going to give up. You know what I mean? They're holding that line, even yep. if it doesn't make sense to them, or even if it fights what they believe, like it just, it blows my mind. Now, since we're on the topic of the, uh, the climate change and kind of proving it to people, through their their own at home experiments, what is something simple that you've been telling people they can try to kind of see how it works on their own at home? Yeah, so absolutely, and in fact, this is my one of my favorite ones to tell people because it, it's so easy to confirm this stuff. Uh, the pivotal argument, right, is that because a lot of times um, uh, people won't even disagree that humans produce CO2 because it's such, it's such a basic fundamental. I mean, that's literally what fire is, right? It's a combustion that yields as a part CO2. That's why fire needs oxygen. And so, you know, not even people on the denialist side say that humans aren't producing CO2. Um, what, what they will say though, is that CO2 isn't a greenhouse gas and doesn't contribute to warming. And to this, I say, I propose to you now a super simple experiment that you can do at home to confirm this. Uh, and that's just to take two of the, those like two liter soda bottles that you get from like a pizza place, just get two of those bottles, empty them out. You need one piece of spe specialized equipment, air quotes there for the audio listeners. Uh, and that is a, a CO2 based uh, whip, like whipped cream maker. Mm -hmm. You can get these for about $30 on Amazon. Check your local um, ordinances and stuff before you do that, because I know there are some countries or states where they're banned because people use them to do whippets. Yeah, they do whippets. Um, but when you're buying it, specifically look not for a nitrous whipper, but for one that runs on CO2. Uh, or one that is safe to use CO2 cartridges with. Then literally all you have to do is this. 
take one of the the two liter bottles and and just have it open nothing inside other than like normal atmospheric air put the cap on it so that it's airtight and then write control on the side and that's your normal atmospheric air for the other one put a co2 can in the whipper don't put milk in it or anything then just turn it upside down put the nozzle in the in the second bottle and squeeze the trigger until you've displaced all of the normal air and so that the only gas inside that water bottle is co2 now right from the cartridge yep. then throw the cap back on and write co2 on the side the only other thing that you have to do now is set those outside for a couple hours. Give them four or five hours in the sun, have them in the same place so that one is not in shade. They're in the same environment. When you come back, just feel them with your hands. Or if you want to be more scientific about it, use a thermometer to, to actually get the temperature. When you come back in a couple hours of those being in the sun, the one that is filled with CO2 will be significantly noticeably hotter than the one that's just normal gas because CO2 is a greenhouse gas and that's just how it works. And this is such a trivially easy thing for people to do at home. And it's also fighting more temperature because when you released it out of the whippet bottle, it would have been colder than atmospheric air. Exactly. Which is why I say give it a couple hours for things to equalize, you know, all things being equal. But um, but that just means yeah, an even greater temperature difference. Exactly. Yeah. You know what's an interesting uh, argument that I keep hearing from, uh, I guess I'll call them climate change deniers. Uh, I tell them all the time, you know, you know, they'll ask me, like, Jerry, why do you want an electric car? And I was like, well, first of all, they're cool. And second of all, they're not emitting greenhouse gases. There's other mm -hmm. issues. That, and there's not much we can do on a consumer level, but right. their argument is always, well, that's a waste of time because the earth is always changing uh, anyway. It's going to go through these changes. So their argument is that the climate's changing because it was going to anyway. And I, what I usually point out is, yes, it goes through cycles and we, maybe we are due for one to, to uh, warm up. But the issue is because of what we're doing, when it warms up, it's not going to stop and cool down again. It's going to go out of well, control. So here's the thing that right now is happening. Right. What what should be happening right now is we should be entering an ice age. Yeah, we're due for an we're ice not age for like 20 years. <laughs> yeah. So Earth historically goes through these periods of what are called glacial, which is like ice age and then interglacial. I have a very uh, well drawn chart in my my book here in front of me that uh, this is where I uh, quantify all of the craziness inside my head. You see that chart right there? Yeah. So the blue periods uh, are the periods of the glacial periods where things have gotten colder. And then those pink or red periods, those are the interglacial periods where things warmed up really quickly. Uh, and what causes this is uh, something called the Milankovitch cycle. It has to do with the fact that uh, the reason that the Earth experiences seasons is because our the axis that we rotate around is tilted relative to like the plane that we're orbiting the sun on. And so during one part of the year, the northern hemisphere is going to experience more sun. And then during the other part of the year, the southern hemisphere is going to experience more uh, from the sun. And that's what causes uh, summer and, and winter and all the seasons. And it's also the reason that they're opposite in the different um, hemispheres. Uh, hemispheres. Exactly. So a lot of Americans, because they're very, uh, you know, U.S. centric, don't realize that when it's winter here in, in America, it's winter or it's uh, summer uh, in the southern hemisphere. And so people don't, you know, really understand that, but that's what causes seasons is the fact that the earth is tilted. Um, that tilt because of the movement of other planets in the solar system and moons and a variety of other things wobbles just a little bit. And it goes from, I have the actual, the exact number here. Um, so I, I can be as accurate as we possible. Actually, uh, they, I just read an article the other day that the earth has tilted or shifted its tilt. So you now have another like point, zero two four nanoseconds in a day hey <laughs> yeah so the the well. tilt uh is about 2.4 degrees which really doesn't seem like a lot when you think about how um how much you know how big the earth is but that 2.4 degree tilt uh from 22.1 to 24.5 has a really big impact and the reason is that when it when that tilt becomes more extreme, the part of the Earth that is experiencing a summer will experience that summer hotter and longer. And so the problem with this 
is that, or sorry, not the problem with this, but the way that the earth naturally works is that uh, every time we're about to enter an interglacial period where it's about to get really warm, the earth is going to hit what we call maximum obliquity, which is it gets to that 24 Point five. It is as tilted as it's going to get. And that kind of starts this cycle of the earth gets warm. That will cause CO2 to dissolve out of the ocean. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, so it will warm things up more. You get this really rapid temperature spike until the axis of the earth starts to tilt back the other way. It's kind of a self-limiting reaction. And then you go into that glacial period where you enter an ice age because now the, the, you know, the, the earth is moving farther away. So to people that say the earth is changing all the time, we have already hit maximum obliquity. We're on our way back the other way. Uh, And more importantly, uh, we, the other, the only other factor besides like the, the, the angle of earth's axis that can cause uh, an increase in global temperatures would be if there were some external increase in the amount of energy we're getting from the sun Uh, and humans do this really odd thing where, If there is a thing that can be counted, and I mean anything that can be counted, you bet your ass that there is a group of people that have been counting that thing for as long as humans can count. And it turns out one of these really obscure things that humans have liked to to count is the number of black dots on the sun. And for as long as humans have had telescopes and the audacity to stare directly into the sun, (laughs) they have been keeping track of how many black dots there are on the sun. And then over time, Uh, science has gotten a lot better. The point is that you can use the number and size of these black dots to very accurately predict the temperature of the sun within a certain range. Um, So we've been able to confirm that over the last several hundred years, the sun is not producing more solar radiation. In fact, if anything, it is slightly decreased over that time. So in other words, the angle of tilt for the earth that normally causes this period is getting shallower. So it should be getting colder and the radiation from the sun is also slightly decreasing. So that's not causing the warming yet. The temperature is not going down. There is one thing, however, that that is up and it's CO2. And this is the kind of the aha moment that a lot of people had on stream was I showed this chart that shows that when you look historically at temperatures on the surface of the planet and the prevalence of CO2 in the atmosphere, they correlate one to one so exactly that it, I I don't want to overstate this, but like it is very rare in science to find causal relationships that are this strongly linked by data. Uh, I mean, often, even when you have direct causal relationships, there's like random noise that makes the relationship less precise than the one between temperature and CO2. The only difference with regards to CO2 and the temperature now is that normally in this whole get hot, get cold cycle, the earth gets hot first, then the CO2 levels go up because it's causing CO2 to bubble out of the ocean, right? This time, the CO2 went up first and then it got hot. Now, I don't mean the interglacial period uh, prior to, to humans now because we weren't burning fossil fuels. But what I'm saying is like when you look at the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, when humans started burning immense amounts of fossil fuel and releasing a bunch of CO2 into the atmosphere, we saw an uptick in CO2 and then we saw an uptick in temperature. And that was the kind of big indicator that like, OK, this is definitely tied to something that humans did. And then you go into how we know, you know, all the various things we know about fossil fuels. But to people to kind of clarify to people that say, well, the earth does this all the time. You're right. It does. And right now we should be getting colder, but we aren't. Now, I guess it, realistically, the, the the first question I would go to is really how do we reduce our CO2 output? I mean, A, we're producing it, but our cars are producing it at a True. astronomical amount. And so either A, you switch everyone over to electric cars and hopefully their power plant is nuclear, which it probably mm-hmm. isn't. You know what I mean? So it, yeah, it's something we have to tackle. And hopefully it sounds like we might be to a degree, but we need to get on it even more. I mean, we did an episode on the different energies of the world, and I was blown yeah. away to find out that China has put more money and research into clean energy than the U.S. has. 
Yeah. But they're all exactly. they're also creating more greenhouse gases than the entire world combined at the moment as we speak. Well, yeah. True. And that and people blame that on the fact that they're still in the process of industrializing their economy. And well, to some extent, I do understand that. It doesn't mean that can't be done uh cleanly. It just means that it's more expensive. It's a it's a trickier situation for them specifically. But you hit on the point in terms of how do we um reduce that. The important thing that I, I wanted, or one of the important things, I will get to the most important thing later. Uh, but one of the important takeaways I wanted people to have from that big three hour live stream uh, was it, that if we want to stop this from getting really bad, and I mean, bad, bad, we can talk later if you guys want about what sort of things will happen if climate change stays unchecked. But if we want to prevent that situation, it's not just a matter of taking our total greenhouse gas emissions to zero. It's the process of reversing it. We need to have a negative carbon footprint. And primarily, this is done through a process called carbon sequestration. And it's basically the idea of taking CO2 out of the air and either putting it somewhere where it can't go back or turning it into something else. So plants can do carbon sequestration. This is called bio sequestration, where like algae are incredibly efficient at, at taking in CO2 and producing oxygen in combination with sunlight, right? Um, but other things that you can do in terms of like uh, land uh, sequestration is they have methods for taking CO2 out of the air and injecting it into concrete. And it becomes like part of the, the carbon subbase of the concrete where it can then not in theory escape. Um, and so there's different me avenues of doing that, but, uh, primarily, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head. It, we can't just move everyone to electric cars because especially when you look at a country like, uh, you know, China and developing countries, uh, their almost their entire power grid is based entirely on the burning of fossil fuels. So you're kind of just kicking the can down the road, not even timeline wise. You're just, you're covering your eyes and pretending it's not happening anymore because you're not the one doing it. Um, and so what, what it really comes down to is 72% of the man emission of, uh, sorry, 72% uh, of man's emission of, uh, greenhouse gases is energy use. And that's why the number one focus that we need to have is switching the energy production over to, uh, safe and effective, uh, green forms of, uh, renewable energy or of nuclear energy. Which we are actually, we came across those same numbers on our, uh, renewable energy episode a while back. And uh, I was excited to see the uh, the advances they're having in nuclear energy. Same. Yeah. So uh, Andy and I same. both are very excited about that, which as it turns out, they started that in the 80s. And it's just now getting to the point where we might have the new reactors up and running for the 2030s. Yeah. Which yeah. Jerry and I both like nuclear, but the average public is scared shitless of it. Well, and that's for a lot of different reasons, but it's primarily because when most Americans think nuclear, they think Chernobyl, they think mm -hmm. Fukushima, they think Three Mile Island. Oh, yeah. uh, what they don't realize is that your odds of being hurt or killed in any capacity uh, as a pizza delivery driver are around 100 times higher than working working in a nuclear power facility and your odds of just being killed by being struck by lightning twice are higher than being a civilian killed by nuclear energy. So I feel like people, because they associate it with those big incidents, the only ones where it went wrong, it's kind of like, uh, uh, not to to give any credence to the CIA, but you know that whole motto uh, that the CIA has about if we do our job right, no one will know that we've done our job at all. Yeah, right. That's nuclear energy, right? When you're doing it right, it's not a news story. It's just another way to make power. Yep. It's only when it goes wrong that nuclear energy hits the headlines. And so that people have that kind of correlation where they hear nuclear and they think Chernobyl and they go, oh, I don't want any of that. Um we can't. That's why I'm a really big uh, proponent for a type of, so I'm a hu obviously a huge proponent for nuclear fusion, but that's not yet a viable uh, source. I hope it will be. Uh, but when, when we look into like traditional nuclear reactors, um, I think the, the two best things that you could do to kind of alleviate the public's concern about that is one, just education. I feel like people think nuclear reactor and then they imagine like Homer Simpson in, in the nuclear reactor, right? It, glowing green science magic. And they don't realize that like fundamentally a nuclear reactor is functionally identical to like a, a like the steam engine on an old train. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. only difference is whether you're burning coal or smothering something radio radioactive. Um, it's just how you get your heat. That's the only difference. Yeah. We and uh, your car engine. Exactly. Your car engine makes heat, the heat, the heat makes steam, steam pushes a turbine, turns a generator. 
Exactly. The problem is that we what we've constantly run into with people who are are typically it's a scared right they they have a fear, is it it comes down to the they're not going to put in the research to figure out what they need to figure out to not be scared of this thing anymore. Of course and, not. So hopefully things like your show and our show will do things like that where it'll explain it in a way that's a hopefully fun <laughs> and they can get something out of it so they're not scared so far. Jerry and I have both worked in the nuclear industry and oh wow if you saw what they allowed as a mistake and what they believe like so their idea is chernobyl or three mile island or the fukushima that is catastrophic failure that is they right. fucked up so bad that everything went wrong right what they yeah. allow themselves is like not even a fraction of a percent of that if they fuck up beyond past that fraction of a percent they shut it all down yeah and the regulation is so high in it when that's for a good thing i mean there are dangers working with nuclear energy but i feel like the other thing is really as far as i'm aware the only like nuclear disaster that was really the fault of the staff at the facility was chernobyl uh i'm not super familiar with what happened at three mile island so possibly that one as well but the other one that people love to bring up was the fukushima incident in japan and I feel like people forgot that there was a fucking tsunami <laughs> that happened. It's not like the reactor just melted down. It got hit by a tsunami. And, oh. and the problem with that is that they, they often build nuclear reactor facilities next to the ocean because you need to cool the reactor somehow. And obviously the ocean's pretty the ocean's goddamn a good great source of water. Scene. Yeah. Exactly. And we need to be careful with that because, of course, we don't want to raise the temperature of the ocean too much. But it's in, in small scale, it's a convenient uh, heat sink. And so... Uh, they often build them there, right? Japan is located on the edge of a tectonic uh, plate and, and that fault line ruptured and it caused a tsunami that that took out a lot of the critical infrastructure around the reactor. And that's why the meltdown happened. It's not like somebody pushed the wrong button for lack of a better you know, explanation. It, it was an act of God. Um, and while sure, there are safeguards that could have been put in place or, or actions that could have been taken to potentially mitigate damage. I don't want to play the game of what ifs. I want to look at the brass tacks fact that the overwhelming majority of nuclear generation facilities across the world are safe, effective, and they are our number one best hope for getting off uh, a reliance on fossil fuels. And that's the thing. One of the other things I tried to really push in the live stream, I feel like people, uh, People think that the solution to get away from the burning of fossil fuels is to go for just renewable energy. And while yes, we we certainly need to build out a bigger footprint of solar and of wind and, and not really hydroelectric because hydroelectric is already tapped for the most part, but you know, other renewable energy sources. Yep. The reality is not every country has access to a coastline where you can do wave generation. Not every state is going to have a super prevalent amount of sun and regular sunshine. Not every place is going to have sufficient amounts of land or, or wind for wind generation, but you know, rain, snow, or shine, nuclear reactors work. So the Three Mile Island, I think if it came down to it, was shoddy parts and maintenance. Because yeah. It was, it was a valve wouldn't, wouldn't shut. Or wouldn't, okay. It was a valve wouldn't shut. Now, what a lot of uh, the skeptics are not giving any credence to here is in, in the entire history of using nuclear as energy, we've had a handful of major incidents, really less than that. But yeah. they're not giving any credence to the fact that we're learning from those incidents. Exactly. There's only, I, I can guarantee at least 99% of the things that went wrong are now something that we're prepared to handle if it happens again, or we're prepared to make sure it does not happen again. Exactly. And one of the other things like that people don't realize is the biggest one that gets pointed to Chernobyl, right? Chernobyl at the time that it happened, we already knew that that specific model of, of uh, I think it's the RKBM reactor that they were yeah. using, RBM. even at the time that it melted down was obsolete and considered by the broader nuclear community an unsafe reactor yeah. because of the problem with the, the graphite tipped control rods and a variety of other control mechanisms. Like when it melted down, it was known that it wasn't safe, but the Soviet Union made the decision not to renovate it or, or to, to replace it primarily just because of greed it was a money thing um and and even on the night that it happened there was the the testing and the, and the restriction on power usage in the area it was not you know I, i'm not going to say it's not the staff's fault it absolutely was i forget the the name of the guy that was in control of the uh, the room but the Dyatlov. the yes thank you Dyatlov. 
Uh, that guy was is an insane, and the reason Chernobyl <laughs> happened is because of him. Um, that being said, uh, I, it's not like no blame lies with the the USSR in terms of the, oh, the management of that facility and the financial decisions that led to having that reactor exist in the state that it did. Well, that was what we covered in our episode on Chernobyl, actually, was that from the day that they drew up the plans for Chernobyl, they were cutting corners. Did yes. They, not, not only was it improperly run it wasn't built right either and on top of that it was built on what is essentially an obsolete platform yep so it was wrong from the day they thought about it to the day that it blew up which when people that scares the shit out of everyone with well at least russian communism (laughs) exactly (laughs) and that's a little bit of that with china too True, although I don't feel it's really even fair to consider China communist anymore because yeah. of how heavily the market economy influences the, the state of the country. Um, there is certainly a level of communist control there, but it's not it, it's a, it's its own special, much like Russia. It, it is divergent from communism in theory. Well, it's uh, communism for what, as far as the, the, the problem wasn't really communism in Russia, right? Because Russia wasn't communist realistically it was so well exactly well, the idea of a state being communist is inherently contradictory yeah exactly yeah and china is an odd odd i can't speak english <laughs> uh autocracy autocracy yeah autocracy, autocracy yeah. thank you yeah uh but it's still you know their people are still making money in the same way that, that communism is, puts out money but the problem with that sense is still you have this whole thing of I think it was this week they had a fucking um, a leopard get out of the zoo and they didn't tell anyone for a week because they feared <laughs> death. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a problem when you can't report an issue because you're fearing the fact that you're going to get killed for it. True. And that's what the biggest it, Chernobyl was bad, right? Yeah. But really what was bad on top of it was the fact that no one could tell anyone that they were fucked up. And exactly. It was the way they handled it after it happened. Way. Yeah. And on well, even if you go beforehand, right? they were getting to a point where they really shouldn't have been doing the test. But if they went back to their their superiors and said, hey, we can't do the test, they're either losing their job, they might die. <laughs> you know what I mean? So of course they're going to lie. Of course they're going exactly. to go forward with these things. And it's so, the go along to get along mentality. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, in America, yeah, you're safe with nuclear energy. Hopefully the rest of the world is there too. But that I think is one of the biggest fears that people have is they, they see these other countries and they see the lies and they see the bullshit that they're putting out, and that scares the shit out of them. True. It's it's unfortunate. But I believe somewhere in this, we were supposed to be talking about coffee, Jerry. <laughs> Before we <laughs> got a little coffee, off. Though. Before we get into coffee. Uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Because, <laughs> so the United States is kind of, uh, well, as you've said, Grizz, that we're not really the leader in renewable energy because that's China right now. Mm-hmm. But we are leading, I think, in the ideology behind fixing climate change uh, as far as a general population. Well, it de- define leading. Because I think it's actually France. France, I believe, is leading the ide- ideology of climate so change. So the, we're not doing more than everybody, but our, our, citiz- our citizenry is fully behind yeah, okay. renewable energy and fixing the climate change problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I feel that that's somewhat dist- has that, that it, not that it is but that it has been somewhat distorted on the world stage because of trump's actions as president yes. like yes. removing us from the paris climate accords that made a lot of our allies go okay this might not be as rock solid as we were hoping it would be let's not really give them too much credit with regards to this mm-hmm. uh and then that's something that we're in the middle of recovering from obviously yes but and yeah. in that recovery joe biden if you guys have been following the news he has uh a $2 trillion infrastructure bill. Yes. And in that bill, he has earmarked $10 billion to reinstate the Civilian Climate Corps. Are you guys familiar with what that is? No, No, actually. So the Civilian Climate Corps ran for about nine years. It started, uh, I want to say it was either during or just after the Great Depression. FDR instated this uh, organization. It's kind of like the Peace Corps, and it got dissolved nine years later when World War II started. So... Uh, it didn't get far, but it was a good premise at the time. It was, it was for men only. And it was really for younger people and it had a lot of issues. So what they, what they're doing now with uh, the Biden administration is they want to reinstate essentially the modern equivalent to the civilian climate Corps, 
And what the, po- the point of this is for basically uh, environmental stewardship. And I don't know what's going to happen with it yet. I'm hoping that it takes off and actually becomes reality. Because for one, it's offering a lot of environmental and outdoor-based jobs to people. And in America, which is what I was talking about, the citizenry is very uh, conscious of this situation. Yeah. He's going to be basically building an infrastructure around the core where people that don't have a skill set but want to get into uh, environmental stewardship, they'll be able to go work in this civilian climate core. And they'll be doing things like uh, taking care of uh, the the, uh, national parks and things like that, going to help with uh, forest fires, any kind of natural disaster like hurricanes, Mm -hmm. or, or even oil spills. So they will have people that are paid specifically to take care of these issues. And they have a a bigger goal, really, where people can go in here and be able to leave with the ability to go into environmental science as a career. That's awesome. I I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I'm hoping that they actually do something with this once they sort out what's going to happen with it. Because a lot of people actually it's got opposition on both sides. So Republicans in Congress are saying that's a waste of money for $10 billion. And then the Democrats are saying 10 billion is nowhere near enough to get anything done. (laughs) Yeah. And I'd have to agree with the Democrats on that. That's a fair point, but it's, it's more than we have now. And it's a good, Oh, I'm hundred percent for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Once you can establish something like the civilian climate Corps, uh, then you're, you're going the right direction because now you have active citizenry involved in making things change. Yeah. And that was actually the exciting news I had for you, Chris. I figured as much. (laughs) <laughs> that's no, awesome I, it, there's there's a lot of things that i don't necessarily agree with with our government right now but that right there was like a little glimmer of hope for me yeah that's honestly surprisingly based of biden i think uh, that i obviously completely i have to look into it more to understand the the minutia of it but if it is as you say it is and i trust that that's an accurate reading of it that sounds really good to me because it, it solves a variety of problems not only does it help raise public consciousness but it also helps address this problem of you know you keep getting americans that are in the rust belt that are sad because these you know manufacturing jobs have left and, and they, every time there's a presidential candidate for the last 20 years, they're like, what are you going to do to help me get my job back? And the problem that I have is that not a single presidential candidate in the last 20 years has had the balls to look that person in the eyes and say, I'm sorry, but your job isn't coming back. It's not. OK, no, there is. These jobs are gone. They're automated. They, they are cheaper in other countries. And when they're not, they are completely automatable. Look at Tesla. Automotive manufacturing jobs are gone. Mm. And this false promise that we're going to bring those jobs back is just distracting from the larger issue, which is that we now have a lot of Americans that were trained in a field that doesn't exist anymore. So having things like this, that at the same time can be vocational and can be a training opportunity to help get them into a higher paying job uh, is something that I'm in favor of. I don't like that whole attitude of like, there was this story years ago about People, you know, tell like truck. They're the uh, trucking industry has been getting smaller, and truckers are in, and these manufacturing people are like, well, I don't know what to do. And people are like, well, just learn to code, right? I'm not expecting mm-hmm. a sixty <laughs> or you know a fifty eight year old trucker that his whole life to just pick up Python and just become a software dev, move out to Silicon Valley and just chill the life. You know, that's not a realistic expectation of people. But I think having programs like the Citizen Climate Accord could be really beneficial in terms of getting these people reoriented in a way that is both good for them in terms of, you know, furthering their career and having something in the interim, but also really working on an important problem like infrastructure management and climate change. Wasn't so that's also, awesome. Wasn't also that the uh, coal union came out this year and said that they're, they're okay with reducing coal as long as the workers can move over to um, like green energy jobs. I, I, I hadn't heard that, but if that's true, that's awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, they they did the union. they did come to yeah. that conclusion because historically they've been very against any change, obviously because that's how they make their living. Yeah, uh, but I I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was it, it was tied with uh, the Biden administration taking yeah, over. I was say, was they basically conceded and said, yes, we will reduce, like as you're saying, we'll reduce what we're doing if you retrain our people to do what's replacing their job which cool good on them like i have zero issue with that at all yeah yeah absolutely like i understand people got to work but at the same time we can't just keep on going on the way we're going right now i mean cold yeah the worst ones but just in general i don't think i'm that bad (laughs) (laughs) 
I always get to make that joke at least once. (laughs) Now, that was all uh, very important information, but we're actually here for something way more important than saving the planet. And that's motherfucking coffee. That's right. (laughs) So uh, you've been big on coffee right now. I have been big on coffee my entire life, but I have been really into coffee uh, the last just about year and a half. Uh, And it really stems from the fact that uh, what I like so much about coffee is the same thing I like about cooking. It is chemistry that you get to eat and drink, right? Mm -hmm. I am a huge chemistry nerd. A lot of my different subjects that, that are other things I'm interested in them because they're just extensions of chemistry. Like neuropharmacology is interesting to me because it's just brain chemistry. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but coffee specifically is something beautiful because it's something that we all take for granted. Right. But it is in of itself an incredibly complex and nuanced and mature process of, of, of chemical reactions and a million different variables. And I feel like the average person does not understand how much in-depth science there is to just making a, a fucking good cup of coffee. Oh, and the coolest thing about this is that I, over the course of doing all this, have managed to seriously up my own cup game. Um, so I have some of my notes laid out in front of me because I was running through them in the beginning of the episode. Cause I, I'm, when you're a science communicator, or, or at least for me, it's very important to make sure that I'm never at, or I'm always reducing as much as I can, my risk of, um, potentially yeah. spreading false information. Yep. That's something I'm, I'm constantly terrified of. And so before every video, every, you know, subject oriented live stream and everything like this, I like to just run over my notes and just make sure I, I don't yep. say the wrong chemical name or something like that. Um, but mm-hmm. I went through, it, it started when um, I, I asked myself the basic question of uh, cold brew coffee, despite not having any sugar or cream is really sweet and creamy. Why it do that? That was the first question I asked. And that led to a three-ish month long uh, process in which I uh, took extensive notes about the chemistry and acid makeup of coffee, about the amino acids and polysaccharides and brown protein complexes that make up crema, about different brewing methods and sweet cream distributions and so many different things that I, I started to really realize, holy shit, coffee is such a complicated subject. And I was, I was thrilled because it was like, it was a thing that I thought was going to be like a five minute Google, right? Why is nitro cold brew so creamy? And, and, and it kind of sent me down this road where now I've learned so much about coffee. And so I thought it'd be fun to talk uh, about some of the really interesting aspects of how, how coffee and science are so heavily uh, interlinked. If you guys would indulge me. Of course I would. So scientifically speaking, have you determined what is the best cup of coffee? Uh, I believe I have for nitro cold brew. Yes. I, okay, I, I'm so confident that I've come up with a method for this. For those of us uh, in my in a beautiful bastards listenership who don't know, uh, cold brew is not just regular coffee. It's magical coffee. And True. if you've never had cold brew, I recommend you go get some right now. Stop the show and go get it. It will change your life. <laughs> yes. But Cole, what, what is cold brew for people who don't know? Okay, so for people that don't know, and, and cold brew and nitro cold brew are different, but the, the idea behind cold brew is that uh, like with a normal cup of coffee, whether you're making it in a French press or a Keurig or a pour over V60, the idea is fundamentally the same. You are taking some kind of ground coffee bean and you are letting that coffee bean uh, be washed by hot water. Either it's being poured over it or it's sitting and it's emerging like a soup in the case of a French press. And then you're drinking that, that coffee. And in that process, you will have, uh, by way of the water being a solution, you will have extracted a variety of fats, acids, and sugars from that coffee, as well as the beautiful chemical molecule caffeine, and you you get to enjoy it. The primary difference between cold brew and, and normal coffee is that like there is this kind of assumption that cold brew and like uh, iced coffee are the same thing, and they're not. Iced coffee is hot brewed coffee that's been put over ice. Cold brew is specifically coffee that has been brewed at a cold temperature, not just room temp, but it's you've taken coffee grounds and you have combined them with uh, with water in a really cold environment like a fridge um, and then left it for like eight to 10, sometimes even 24 hours. Uh, And the reason that it's so different is that the temperature of the water will really heavily modulate 
not just what you extract from the coffee, but how it is extracted from the coffee. Uh, and what that really comes down to is that water uh, as a solution will always dissolve from coffee in this order. It's fats and acids first, which if nothing else would be like sour and oily, it wouldn't be good on its own. But the real magic comes when you bring like the sugars and the amino acids out. And that's kind of the second thing that gets dissolved out. And then the last thing that gets dissolved is the plant fibers and that's where bitterness comes from. Uh, and so the real art of making good tasting smooth coffee is getting a good blend of fats, acids, and sugars and amino acids, but stopping it before you get some of those bitter effects. And in my experience, it really comes down to the modulation or the, the controlling of different acids. But for listeners at home, what nitro cold brew is, is it basically it's coffee grounds that are combined with cold water in a cold place like a fridge for 10 to 24 hours uh, that are then put into a, a machine that will infuse the coffee with nitrogen, pure N2, not nitrous oxide, uh, if you want to be a Banff like be myself. Um, <laughs> and then it's poured into a glass and the end result uh, is black coffee that despite having no cream and no sugar is smooth and creamy like a Guinness and, and almost has a kind of fruit like sweetness to it. Um, and it is a truly breathtaking experience for uh, I've given my nitro cold brew recipe to people who don't like black coffee at all and people who don't like cold coffee at all. And in both cases, they were like, holy shit, this is a game changer. <laughs> Is that something you're willing to share? Because I'm, I'm absolutely so dude. That's the whole point of science is I I'd like to walk you through the science of, uh, I don't think we can go through the entirety of, of how, um, no, no, I, I'm okay. Let's do just some notes after the show because the, I don't know how to make cold brew at home. I don't have anything to do it other than a fridge. So most of the time the cold brew I get is Dunkin' Donuts, which is really bitter sometimes. Yeah. So no, I, I can actually, I can totally from memory and from the, the few notes I have in front of me, I can totally explain the chemistry behind how I got what I'd consider to be a perfect coffee. What I meant to say is that in one in one podcast episode, unfortunately, I cannot uh, instill all of the, the knowledge that I've gained about this beautiful bean, but I think I can go over the, the, the science and the chemistry behind uh, how you get the, the kind of perfect cold brew, nitro cold brew coffee. Well, before we get into the, the actual science of it, did you, did you get it down to a specific brand? It's so I, I have brands that I buy from, but it's not as simple as get it from this brand because I make it myself with the, the okay. coffee grounds and it highly depends on what things are available in your area, what things can be gotten fresh. I'm a huge proponent of buying local coffees or from like local roaster. Obviously, if you live in America, you're not going to get local grown coffee uh, because they have to come from different climates. That's just the, the climate in America is not conducive to caffeine or to, to coffee plant growth. Uh, but and by the way, then to tie this back in the other thing, the global warming poses an actual existential threat to coffee varieties. Uh, and while there is a, a lesser known uh, variety of coffee that is not Robusta or Arabica uh, that does better in warmer temperatures, it's extraordinarily rare and has only very recently been saved from extinction. So if you want to continue to drink coffee, stop polluting the environment so please realistically that's how you're gonna fuel the whole green climate issue that's yes it exactly like it's not save the coffee. planet it's save it's, the coffee. do you want coffee exactly <laughs> um listen you're gonna have to give up yeah and people will do it too oh hell yeah um but yeah so when i go through the science uh what i will try and do is i will I'll, I'll, at, at moments that i've finished the scientific explanation for a thing I will just state in as plain and regular terms as possible what you want to look for on a bag to get the thing that I just talked about. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> that way dumb people like me can understand. Oh, don't sell yourself short. I, I think anyone hopefully will be able to understand what, at least the gist of what I'm talking about, but uh, I, I, I can't promise I won't get a little um, ranty because this is something that I, I've be, put so much time and effort into learning that it's something that really interests me. faith in our listeners that they'll understand it. I do too. All right. So what's the first step in this coffee making business to get the perfect coffee? 
So the first step is mindset. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the first step uh, you, you like with any coffee brew is going to be that you want to get good quality beans. And I'm going to go over some of the different things that can change the way that, that a bean uh, tastes. Uh, but primarily it comes down to the processing, the, the, um, uh, like where it was grown and the the actual roasting process. And those, cause those are the three things that really modulate flavor in the coffee. So the first thing is where, where it's grown, right? When you go to your grocery store or your local like coffee boutique area, and you're looking at bags of coffee, they'll say like Honduras, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Indonesia and stuff. Right. And that's not just like fancy marketing terminology. It's actually pretty important where coffee comes from because uh, the primary thing that differentiates uh flavors in these different areas has to do with the altitude at which the coffee is grown. Now, before I go into this, I do just want to say one thing. Uh, in America, there are really only two primary kinds of coffee that will be readily available in like a Safeway or a Vons or a Kroger's or something. And that is, uh, you'll see Arabica or Robusta. Um, this is not up for debate. Arabica is the correct choice. Robusta is objectively wrong. It has way too much chlorogenic acid. I will not go into this point farther. Robusta is, it's a cheap plant that grows very quickly and very high in caffeine content, but it is not in any way, shape or form a quality coffee plant. Uh, and so I, I am pretty firmly on the Robusta hate train. <laughs> so that's, that's takeaway one. Don't buy that. Takeaway one, one get is, Exactly. So if you're taking notes, takeaway one is whatever beans you get, if you pay attention to nothing else, try and get them uh, in the Arabica variety. If not, don't even try. Because um, <laughs> I, I, I can't, I've done cupping tests. I really cannot understate the, the difference in, in flavor. It's not just that Robusta tastes bad. It's that it, it almost feels unfair to compare them on any level. Uh, Arabica is more full bodied. It has more fruity notes. It has a sweetness and a brightness to it that are, that Robusta can't really because the chlorogenic uh, acid content in Robusta is so high. I struggle to get any words other than dry and astringent. If you've ever had like really trash, like office coffee that, mm -hmm. that was bad, that flavor that you associate with that is primarily chlorogenic acid and quinic acid. Uh, and those things are very, they're very prominent in Robusta. I think um, Robusta has around twice as much CGA when compared to Arabica varieties. Uh, so it, it really is a, a huge difference. So that's step one. You want to get an Arabica bean. Step two is where, where it's grown, right? Coffee that is grown uh, to be quick. And, and I want to be clear here. As long as you're getting Arabica, no matter where you get it from, you're, you'll probably be getting an okay cup of coffee so long as you're brewing it right. So at this point, like if you've made that choice, you, you can really only go up from here. But uh, for coffee that needs to be like have a quick turnaround. So coffee that's grown by like Folgers or like Starbucks grows almost all of their coffee in Indonesia because it's at a low altitude, right? The, the coffee plantations in Indonesia uh, occur at a low altitude, which means that there's a lot of oxygen. So the turnaround on coffee growth is really quick. Um, they can get these beans out quickly. It's good for industrial production. Even like a Lipton tea will grow their tea in, in low altitudes in Indonesia because of the same reason. Lots of oxygen means quick turnaround. But personally, and of course, there's an element of subjectiveness in all of this because, um, you know, it, it's a tasting thing. So there has to be some uh, subjective characteristics of what I value in coffee. Uh, but I'm really a fan of higher altitude coffees, like coffees from Ethiopia. Uh, so if you can find Arabica from Ethiopia, that's that's another th good thing to look out for. And the reason for that is um, when you're going to the gym and you're lifting like really heavy weights, you're running really fast, you're doing a lot of cardio or something. Uh, what's happening is that your body is using a lot of energy. And the reason that your heart rate increases and that your, uh, your, your respiration increases and, and a variety of other factors is that there, for the amount of energy that you're doing, there's not really enough oxygen in your blood. And this is what we refer to as anaerobic respiration. Um, so what your body does is when you, when you're working really hard and you're, you're getting to this anaerobic respiration stage because your body can't get its energy from oxygen, which it needs for ATP and some other stuff. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to produce lactate, 
which is going to get broken broken down into lactic acid. That is the thing that makes your muscles hurt. If you've had a really like if if you did leg day at the gym and then the next day you're like I'm fucking dead. That's lactic acid buildup in your legs from the fact that the exercise that you were doing caused your body to become anaerobic. It turns out that the exact same um, process takes place in coffee. If you grow coffee at really high altitudes, like in Ethiopia, where there's a lot less oxygen compared to somewhere like Indonesia, uh, the coffee to grow the, the actual fruit, uh, will go into this kind of anaerobic respiration process. It will produce lactate that will break down into lactic acid. And that doesn't really sound like an appealing quality in coffee. Um, but surprisingly, it's actually kind of good. Lactic acid, so long as it's done properly, has kind of a fruity brightness to it, almost kind of like a sparkliness that really complements the the kind of uh, neutral acidity of uh, cold brew coffee. Uh, and so I found in my testing that higher altitude coffees like Ethiopian coffees, uh, for me, tended to yield better results. Um, it's not so much a one-to-one correlation of being stronger. Uh, it's I don't know whether or not there's any specific, because when we think about strong coffee, you could either be thinking about the caffeine content, uh, in which case Robusta is objectively stronger than Arabica. That's kind of the benefit of Robusta is that if you're trying to, to extract caffeine from it to get like pure white powder, like anhydrous caffeine. Um, then Robusta is the go-to because it's so much higher in caffeine content. And if you're trying to make like instant coffee or something, that's when you want the the strongness of Robusta. But if you're talking about like bold flavors, I yeah. think that it's roughly analogous. Yeah. I feel like coffee is grown at higher altitudes tend to have a kind of, it's not even so much like a boldness of flavor as it is like a depth of flavor. It's a more nuanced kind of dynamic range of taste. Um, my, my caffeine addiction is such that I'll pass on bad coffee. I'd rather be tired than drink coffee. That's not good. Yeah. I, at, the, I, at this point, hundred percent agree. Um, <laughs> at the point where the caffeine doesn't actually wake me up anymore. All right. <laughs> you ever, you ever done the thing where, uh, you put on for like, for the first time in, in a long time, you put on like ridiculously good headphones, like really audiophile quality yeah. headphones. And you listen to a song you've listened to a thousand times and you hear things in the song that you've never heard before. Mm hmm yeah, all, all that, those little, uh, little, little extra pieces you can't hear. Exactly, exactly. That is kind of analogous to to what the higher altitude coffees are like, in the sense that uh, there, there's just more there. There's more substance there. So that's the first thing is uh, you want to get Arabica and you want to get a high altitude coffee. If you don't want to look up other ones, Ethiopia is pretty much always a good bet for from what I found. The mountainous regions there are, are pretty good. Uh, the next thing that that prepares with the bean processing uh, has to do with what there are two primary. There are a bunch of different processes, but there are really two that are common. And it's uh, what's called washed processing or natural processing. So for our, a lot of Americans have never really seen a coffee fruit before, but it, re, it kind of it's like a cherry. It's kind of like a green red fruit and then in the center of it is like what we would think of being the pit of the cherry and that is like the coffee bean so in order to get coffee into like the usable state we need to get that pit out of the fruit and there's a couple of different ways of doing that the uh one of the very common methods which is very like neutral it doesn't change the coffee in any way is called washing and it's really simple they literally just wash them with water uh, and the, the fruit part just kind of degrades naturally in the water and the bean is left behind and then they're left to dry out in a field for, I don't know, 10 to 20 days on average. Uh, and then at that point, the bean is done and they'll go to a roaster. And it's it's a very natural, pro it's, even though it's not, I don't want to call it natural processing because the other one is literally called natural processing, but it's, <laughs> it's a very neutral way to process coffee. Uh, the flavor of the bean will remain completely unchanged. It is not affected at all by the... Um, but the actual, you know, processing. And so whatever the flavor of that coffee is, is going to stay true to whatever the flavor of that coffee is, which is why for like, um, there's this thing in, in coffee tasting called Q grading, which is like quality grading of coffee. And a lot of Q graders to experiment with new varieties of coffee, they like to get the washed variety because it's, it doesn't change the flavor at all. So it allows them to get a better understanding of like, uh, yeah. What exactly that bean, what are the qualities specific to that bean? Not about the, the, the right. process or anything. 
What I prefer, however, uh, is what's called natural processing, also known as coffee fermentation. And it's exactly what it sounds like. As opposed to taking the coffee and putting it in in water and washing it away, you literally just take them and you kind of leave them exposed to to heat, sometimes outside. And what will happen is natural um, bacteria that's on the outside of the the coffee fruit or the the, the cherry, um, specifically uh, lactobacillus is one of the more common types of bacteria. Uh, will and, and also yeast, like just natural yeast, which will be as part of the cherry, will ferment the the fruit, and this can actually change the the chemical structure of the bean inside. And while it's less neutral because it will change the flavor of the bean, I really like it specifically because this fermentation process will create a lot of sugars. And the net result is that when you brew coffee with uh, beans that have been naturally processed as opposed to washed, where they've been fermented, the coffee that you get out of it is noticeably sweeter. Uh, it, it's not, it, it's also got a bit of a creaminess to it, not substantially, but it's primarily, it's, it's a really good way of bringing that sweetness that I associate with nitro cold brew out of the bean. So to recap, if you're looking for coffee and you, you got, you got your options, you want high altitude, Arabica, naturally processed or fermentation processed. And that is all that goes along with like the type of bean. There is one more thing. And this kind of more comes down to personal choice. So I'm not going to make like a very uh, prescriptive statement here, but it's the the level of roasting. You've heard of like light roast, medium roast, dark roast and all that. Um, the, the process of chemically or no, not chemically, the process of roasting coffee is basically you put coffee in, in an oven, it gets hot and then it, it browns that chemical process uh, is the same, the exact same thing that happens when you throw steak on a grill and it browns that that's called the Maillard reaction. Uh, and basically what's happening is that like sugars and amine, the sugars and amino acids that are present in the bean, when you expose them to high heat, they're going to develop a flavor. And the roasting process is where you start to get some of the more bold flavors. So darker roast coffee can often have a kind of caramel or chocolatey quality to it, uh, which some people really like. Again, this is heavily a personal uh, a personal taste thing. If you like kind of lighter, brighter coffee, a light roast is better because you're going to get less of those savory uh, kind of round. I I don't I don't know if this is like a synesthete thing, but I feel like coffee that's darker roast is for lack of a better term, like round. I don't know why that's the shape I associate <laughs> with it, but it's like it's curvy. Uh, for some reason, that's the way my brain perceives it. And a lot of people like that. It's totally a personal choice thing. I tend to opt for kind of medium roast because I think it's a good balance between the two. If you don't know what you like, I would start with a medium roast coffee. Um, but those are, those are all the things. So just get the roast that you like, look for a, a high altitude Arabica that was naturally or fermentation processed. And that's all that goes into bean selection. And I promise that it gets easier from here. That was the most complex part. Well, I know that uh, coffee flavor is subjective, right, Cole? And, exactly. Uh, I just wanted to point out to our listeners that even though the flavor is subjective, Cole's decisions are the correct decisions. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I am. I here, see that thing back there. That's a lab coat. So yeah, I, you know, should I put that on for the rest of this segment? Uh, <laughs> no, we've uh, okay. we've shown it in the frame so people know okay. you wear a lab coat. Good. He's a man to be trusted. Whatever he says, this is this is truth. Yes, this is the the uh, this is the gospel on coffee that we're doing here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so th now that you have the coffee, um, the next step is mindset. <laughs> um, so yeah, get get your beans and uh, please don't keep them in the bag for super long. I know a lot of people that do that and they'll just put like a clothespin when when you open the bag. Don't. Uh, you shouldn't grind coffee until you're ready to use it, but it, it's really best if you can put the beans in like uh, either like a sealed plastic container, not like Tupperware, but like if you go to Target, they have those like reusable uh, containers where like you push a button on the lid and it comes off. Those are really cool. Or in a pinch, mason jars, which is what I use, work just fine. Uh, but you want to have uh, something better than a bag to store your beans for a long term. So you've got your beans, you're ready to make nitro cold brew. What sort of stuff are you going to need? You're going to need some way to grind the beans. You're going to need some way to brew the beans, which uh, in this case is going to be a, a large glass carafe or some sort of uh, like glass pitcher. Um, you could brew it in plastic, but it just, it feels wrong to me. I don't have really any science backing behind that. It just doesn't, this is chemistry we're doing. You got to use glassware. 
I've done this in a beaker, by the way, like a big <laughs> thousand milliliter beaker. Well, um, I'm starting to see plastic not being good anyway. So true. There you go. So yeah, do it for the environment. There you go. Um, and then the other thing that you're going to need, and, and this is really important is you're going to need a nitro whipper. Um, now this is the more expensive piece of kit. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. Some people go to the extreme that eventually I'd like to get to, which is you, you build like a kegerator setup, but it runs on nitrous instead of CO2. And you have like on tap nitro cold brew. And I think eventually that is where I'll get. I just haven't invested the money in that for now. Uh, for anyone who is looking for a relatively inexpensive, but compared to the alternatives, but still really high quality um, nitro whipper, uh, there's a German company called EC. I S I uh, their web page is probably in German, but uh, use the Google translate feature to get it out. They make a phenomenal nitro coffee setup. It's the one I personally use. Um, it's really cool. It's basically, it looks exactly like a, a whipped cream, like a professional whipped cream thing. The one I was talking about with the global warming. Uh, but the only difference is that it's specifically made for uh, coffee. And so what it'll do is when you put coffee inside it and you close it and you put one of the nitro cartridges in it, it's going to infuse the coffee with the nitrogen at really, really high pressures. So for, for some, um, for some reference, like high pressure espresso is typically brewed between like nine and 12 bar. The infusion in the EC whipper is like 15 bar uh, of pressure. So it's, it's really high pressure, but that's good because it forces a lot of that nitrogen gas into the coffee. And I'll explain why, why that's so awesome in a second. Um, but anyways, how do you actually make the coffee? You're going to take your beans and you're going to put them into your grinder and you're going to grind them on a relatively coarse setting um, that because this is taking place over such a long time, um, you don't necessarily need super, super fine ground coffee coffee. If you are on a bit of a time crunch and you don't want to do like a 24 hour immersion, I typically recommend like 12 to 24 hours, but if you want it like a, like do it in the morning, drink it at night kind of thing an eight to 10 hour immersion. Um, I would go with finer coffee because there will be more surface area to extract from. Uh, but if you're planning on doing it the way I do it, which is like a 24 hour immersion, go with a relatively like medium coarse grind. Uh, and that'll be kind of a good starting point for you. Um, well, the then you're going to measure that out. goes towards how strong it is, doesn't it? It can. Uh, so yeah, finer ground coffee is going to have a significantly higher extraction. Um, and that is what will kind of determine whether or not what you end up with is a concentrate or whether or not what you end up with is just like drinkable uh, cold brew. Um, what I'm aiming for here is not concentrate. It is just ready to go cold brew. So I have the exact ratio here. I, I, I wrote my secret recipe down. Um, the, the end, the ratio that you want is for every 236.5 milliliters of water, you want exactly 28 grams of coffee. Um, measure after you've ground, because sometimes there will be some stuck in the grinder and all that. Uh, scales on Amazon, like the kind you'd see a drug dealer use are cheap. They're like 10 to 15 bucks. It's worth getting one for coffee. Uh, but yeah, 236.5 milliliters to 20 grams of coffee. And you end up with the kind of perfect ratio. Um, you're going to, and then you scale that up or down for whatever vessel you're brewing. in. And from here, it's pretty simple. Dump your coffee grounds in take uh, filtered water. You do not want to use tap water for this for a variety of reasons. There's chemicals in the tap water that will mess with uh, chemicals in the coffee. Specifically, um, there, there are six major acids in coffee, citric, acetic, quinic, malic, chlorogenic, and phosphoric. And three of them, uh, malic, acetic, and uh, phosphoric can kind of get, uh, I don't know what the right word to use for this is, like chemically broken uh, if you expose them to some of the things that are commonly found in like city tap water, um, like some of the minerals and things can, can add kind of a funky taste to it. Um, and it adds not, it's not really a metallic taste, but it, it's a metallic vibe. Mm. Um, and I, I don't coffee personally, flavor. it's a bad coffee flavor. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I if actually you have the same thing with my shitty coffee at home, I don't use yeah. tap water because it makes my shitty coffee shittier. 
Exactly. I have uh, also a tip that I'd like to interject that has nothing to do with nitro cold brew coffee, but it does have to do with coffee. And I think if you take nothing else away from this episode, uh, listener, this is the best advice you'll ever get. Okay. Um, what makes bad coffee bad is merely like I talked about clogenic and quinic acid, and it's going to bond to the bitterness taste receptors on your tongue. And that's what, when you drink like just black, like hotel coffee, and you have that ugh moment, it's that astringency from those two acids. You can remove that to a significant ex- extent by adding just a few grains of salt to your coffee. I know it sounds weird. Really? It, you'd think that it would make your coffee taste like salt water. It doesn't. If you're in a pinch, if you're in a hotel or a, at an AA meeting, it doesn't matter where, and you have like shitty, just generic big brew coffee. And this also really helps with like, uh, like breakfast cafes and hotels or like office environments where you have like a, a drip brewer, but the carafe has been left on a hot plate so that it stays warm. That mm-hmm. hot plate, because because it's keeping the coffee at kind of a bad temperature is continuing to break chlorogenic acid into quinic acid. And that's what, why over time that coffee tastes even worse. Um, but adding just a few grains of salt, uh, can really help. It's kind of hard to dose with salt though. So what I have, uh, is this little tincture bottle. It looks like, a like the, the, what you'd put into a vape, uh, if, if anyone's <laughs> familiar with that, it's that exact same style bottle. Uh, and it is a 10 to one saline ratio. Um, and I just put two drops in my coffee and that's it. Uh, and I, it, it will in a pinch for hotel coffee, airplane coffee, whatever it is, just a couple of drops goes a long way and it, it will significantly reduce the bitterness of it. So that's another science pro that's tip amazing. for you. I also, yeah. I, I wanted to let you get through the coffee part because coffee is important, but I want to point out that when it came to the science experiment, we were worried about cost, but when it comes to coffee, there is no worry about cost. Exactly. <laughs> you just have to go for the best. <laughs> and the EC whipper, it's a little expensive, but it, it's not completely unachievable. I think oh, it's I'm like around, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it's around $200, oh, um, but it's, it is, when you try it, you'll understand why in a pinch, like if the, if because of your socioeconomic situation, whatever the EC brewer just really isn't viable. If you can find a nitro uh, whipped cream machine that would work. Uh, There are some differences about the EC that make it better. First of all, anyone that's in denial that German manufacturing is objectively (laughs) superior has never experienced BMWs or any of the other German things. Um, they, the, they have specifically machined the nozzle to have a very consistent bubble size. They have uh, pressure fitted the entire thing. The threads on it feel like I'm loading a silencer onto a gun. It's so <laughs> eminently satisfying. Um, but I will say this, and I, I'm speaking from personal experience on this mistake. When I first read about this, I thought, okay, well, you know, the EC equipment is really expensive and nitrogen is is more expensive than CO2. CO2 is a dilute gas. I'm just going to use CO2 just as a starting point. Right. So I bought a CO2 cream whipper, like what I was talking about using for the, uh, for the experiment. And, uh, and I used that. And what I found was, despite the fact that I know for a fact that nitro cold brew coffee is supposed to be ridiculously low in acid and very smooth, it was really bitter. And I was perplexed by this. And I'm now going to tie for the second time coffee back into global warming. (laughs) When CO2, the gas, is exposed to water, whether it's in coffee or in the ocean, it's going to create a chemical uh, that is acidic. It's going to change the, the balance of it. It's called carboxylic acid. This is one of the worst and least talked about aspects of climate change. The more CO2 we pump into the atmosphere, the more we increase, the more we decrease the pH balance of the ocean and increase its acidity, which means that very pH dependent things like coral reefs die off. That is the Mm. thing that's driving so much coral reef death besides microplastics is the, the increasing warming and acidification of the ocean. The same exact thing is true with coffee. If you immerse it, in, in CO2, if you infuse CO2, that CO2 is going to create carboxylic acid in your coffee and it's going to produce a more bitter cup of coffee because carboxylic acid don't taste super nice. Uh, nitrogen is perfect because it is a chemically inert gas that has no reaction with water or any of the acids in the coffee. Uh, and, and so it is, that's the, also the reason, by the way, that uh, true proper Guinness is so delicious is because it's also done on nitro. 
Um, if you get it from like a, a tap in a pub or they even have nitro cans now, um, it's done for the exact same reason. Interesting. So that. yeah. Um, those are, those are those two tips going on. And I, there's only a little bit of more science ahead and then I'm done. So long story short, uh, you want to take that ratio, uh, medium coarse grind your coffee and then add it into your, your pitcher or whatever, uh, go ahead and add your water in, and then you're going to place it in a fridge. And when you're starting out, because you know, some people, everyone has different tolerances with coffee. Uh, I would aim for like 12 to 18 hours. So maybe do this at night, go to sleep and then have an alarm the next day to take it out. Uh, and it should be in the fridge that whole time. Uh, it does, you don't have to do this, but I find it really helps if you stir it in the beginning with like a wooden spoon or something to, to make sure that there's a full, all the coffee grounds are wet. And then if you can work it into your schedule, give it a couple of different stirs during that brew time, it'll help get a better extraction out of it. Um, and then in the end, you're done. That's it. All you have are to do now is, is filter it out. What? When, 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 you, when it's in the fridge, are you leaving it open? Is it capped? Uh, so you can cap it. it. It doesn't necessarily need to be fully capped. You should certainly have something over it to, pre- uh, to prevent contamination with anything else in the fridge. Uh, but it doesn't like, it's not like you need to have an airtight uh, cap on it. In fact, if anything, I would recommend that you don't because depending on the coffee and the amount of CO2 in the coffee that was introduced during the roasting process, uh, while it's dissolving, that CO2 can build up pressure. And the last thing that you want is a highly pressurized glass vessel that yeah. you are going to have to open. Um, one of those, uh, those fermenting jars that has like the little bubbler on it. If you want to go super OP with it, that would definitely Listen, work. We yeah. already said there's no cost. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. <laughs> We're going to go full reductive amination. <laughs> um, so once you're done with that, uh, at the end of that 12 to 18 hour period, you take it out and you filter it. And what's left over in that cup is the best goddamn cold brew you're ever going to have in your life. And you can drink it on its own right there. If all you wanted to do is make some kick-ass cold brew, it's ready. And for the record, if you're a scientist like myself, I do recommend trying it a little bit before you put it in the nitro whipper so that you have a point of comparison to see how that mm-hmm. nitrogen um, is going to change it. That's but I want to explain why specifically we want the, to do the nitrous infu- the, ni- the nitrogen infusion and then pour it into a glass. Uh, and the reason for that has to do with what we call uh, surfactants. So a surfactant is a chemical that kind of looks like a a sperm. I know it's kind of gross in coffee, but it'll have a a head and it'll have a tail much like a sperm. And the heads are all hydrophilic, meaning they absolutely love water. And the tails are hydrophobic, meaning that they hate water. Uh, In actual coffee, these surfactants tend to be uh, what we call polysaccharides and brown protein complexes. Uh, But there are many different kinds of them in the coffee and they have some really good characteristics primarily they they taste creamy which is a big thing about i I kept repping it's creamy without having cream so for lactose intolerant people this is really you got to try this um what's going to happen when you infuse the coffee with the nitrogen under pressure is that that nitrogen gas is going to enter the coffee it's going to be dissolved into the coffee and when you pour it and it comes out of that you press the trigger and it comes out of the spout and it goes into coffee. What's going to happen is the, the surfactants are going to surround the, uh, the nitrogen that, that's coming out of solution as a bubble because the heads can all touch water, but the tail, excuse me, the tails that hate water are going to find their way into the bubble because they don't want to be around the water. So what happens is that these surfactants kind of form a shell around these air bubbles. And what you'll get when you pour this nitro cold brew coffee is it will naturally develop a thick and velvety and creamy head like a well porn Guinness. And it is the absolute icing on the cake in terms of having just kick ass, scientifically perfect coffee. Now, hold on one second here. You're, you're telling me that this stuff looks like sperm. It can kind of decide where it wants to be like sperm and it's creamy. It, yeah, they, they, you got it. You got me. I'm in. I'll take it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but that is, that is as far as I, as a scientist have been able to find that is the recipe for scientifically perfect nitro cold brew coffee. Well, so thank you for all this fantastic information because this was, a, this was a great conversation and I actually learned a lot more than I thought I was going to. Well, good. That's always the point, hopefully. But uh, thanks for being on the show. Uh, where can 
people who don't know who you are find you? You can find me on pretty much all social media under the moniker Cole the Science Dude, all one word. Uh, my main social media platform is TikTok, where I make fun and educational videos uh, that used to be under a minute, but now I have the ability to upload three minute episodes. So hopefully, uh, we'll get some more science dense content in there. Uh, but you can also find me on Twitter and on Instagram and on uh, pretty much any other platform. If you want all of my links, you can go to uh, linktr.ee slash Cole the Science Dude. Uh, that's my link tree. And you can find all of my different links on there, including a link to my Discord. So if you have questions about this coffee, feel free to hit me up and I will be happy to enlighten you. Yeah, it was an awesome conversation, man. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. I genuinely hope you do invite me back for the drug war episode because uh, as a neuropharmacologist, I would love to provide some input. Absolutely. Well, you, you're actually, uh, you'd be a perfect fit for that. So we haven't decided when that's going to be, but uh, we would love to have you on for that. Sweet. Well, I would love to be on for that. Well, that was an awesome episode. Uh, fuck me. Wow. How about this? <laughs> well, that was a pretty awesome episode, Grizz. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah dude I, it was great i really enjoyed it uh cole's an awesome dude yeah well, I, i'm we've already talked about it we're gonna have him on again yeah we're excited to talk about the war on drugs with somebody who really knows the science behind drugs and bigger words than we do oh for sure <laughs> i love talking to people smarter than me there's nothing better yeah. than sounding stupid <laughs> uh, but yeah he was a great guest uh hopefully you guys enjoyed it Thank you again for listening to Beautiful Bastards Podcast. Please take a few minutes to give us a rating on iTunes. Uh, it helps us keep the lights on so we can keep bringing you new content. Remember, you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, our website, anywhere else you stream your content from because you all give a shit. And if you enjoy the show, you can find our links at Linktree slash Beautiful Bastards. Or you can check out our website, BeautifulBastardsPodcast.com. And this one will be on YouTube. Coffee and cigarettes. That's like the breakfast of champions. And also, a bad day with coffee is better than a good day without coffee. Unless the coffee makes you shit your pants. What was that grandma boy quote? There's like, there's a, they call it the brown bomber. <laughs> when you smoke it, you shit your fucking pants. <laughs> I, I don't want that. I, I'm all good. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs>